Foylche, Gokdina, and uh, Shalom to everybody here this evening. This is a, another exciting evening uh, to, be, to participate in, and uh, it's the second um, Soldiers for Mary conference. Okay, so we had the last one there just before the end of 2021, so this is our first uh, conference event for 2022. So um, delighted to be here and delighted to have everybody with us again this evening. A lot of uh, new faces in the room, even though I'm blinded by this light. I can see we have a great crowd here this evening. So again, uh, there's a sense of potential here. So let's, uh, the best way to start this evening, so is really with prayers. And we're going to have uh, Brother Sean Grace, an active legionary. He's going to lead us now in the opening legion prayers and the rosary. Bill of us, Sean, come on up on stage and delighted to have you with us. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Emmanuel. Um, uh, good evening, men. It's, it's great to see you all here, and it's a real privilege, I can tell you. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, O Lord, and they shall be created. God, our Father, pour out the gifts of your Holy Spirit on the world. You sent the Spirit on your church to begin the teaching of the gospel. Now let the Spirit continue to work in the world through the hearts of all who believe. Through Christ our Lord. You, O Lord, open my lips. Incline unto my aid, O God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. And uh, we're going to say the sorrowful mysteries. The first sorrowful mystery is the agony in the garden. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of death. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. The second sorrowful mystery is the scourging at the pillar. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. Amen. Amen. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. 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 
Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. 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 Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And the third sorrowful mystery is the crowning with thorns. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. And the fourth sorrowful mystery is the carrying of the cross. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen.
Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. And the fifth sorrowful mystery is the crucifix crucifixion and death of our Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and it shall be, world of death. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of mercy. Hail our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, 
Mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious advocate, your eyes of mercy towards us. And after this, our exile, show unto us blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary, pray for us, O Holy Mother of God. Let us pray. O God, whose only begotten Son, by his life, death, and resurrection, has purchased for us the rewards of eternal salvation, grant, we beseech you, that meditating upon these mysteries in the most holy rosary of the Blessed Virgin Mary, we may imitate what they contain and obtain what they promise through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Most Sacred Heart of Jesus, Amen. Immaculate Heart of Mary, Pray for us. Saint Joseph, Pray for us. Saint John the Evangelist, Pray for us. Saint Louis Marie de Montfort. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Back to you, Emmanuel. Thanks. Brother Sean, uh, thank you so much uh, for leading us all in prayer. And uh, I know we, we, we commented on this at our last evening together, but there is something uh, quite special about men uh, praying together, especially men praying the rosary together. And I think we're here, uh, soldiers for Mary, that's the title. So how fitting, she's the commander in chief. And she, this is the weapon she has given us. And it's great when we center ourselves in prayer and prepare like this. So, um, so I know so, there's been some uh, late comments. Just say, everybody, you're really, really very welcome here. And it's great. It looks like word is spreading. So how epic it is that you guys are here tonight, that you're assembled in prayer, that you're here really under the behest of Our Lady, and that quite possibly you're looking to do more. And hopefully you're going to hear some words of, encour of encouragement and inspiration tonight about being a, a Catholic man in uh, 2022 and what you can do, uh, I suppose, to, to make a difference. Um, I'm here anyway now to introduce our, our first speaker. Uh, his name is uh, Declan Lawler. He's uh, an active legionary. I think there's probably guys in the room who know Declan, and there's probably guys who don't know Declan. So the best way I can introduce Declan, you probably all know the movie uh, The Great Escape. It's probably, they usually play it every Christmas, okay? You've got as many big stars as you're going to get in there, okay? I mean, once you have Bronson in a movie, you know, it's going to be tough. It's going to be a match. And then to have Steve McQueen and all the other guys, I'd say even these guys, their hair probably worked out. That's how kind of tough they were. But there's a great character in there, and uh, it's played by Attenborough. And his character is Roger Bartlett. And he's known as Big X. Now, Big X decides they're in this, you know, stalag. And as the Germans say, we've put all our rotten eggs together, guys. This is it. You're not getting out of this. But Big X decides, no, no, this is where we go, full commitment, okay? And I suppose that's, that's the way Declan Lawler is in the Legion. So sometimes you may feel in 2022 that you're in Stalag Catholic Church, okay? That you're surrounded, that you're not getting out, that the secular forces are closing in. But no, with this guy, trust me, he's going to build many, many tunnels and he's going to try and get as many souls out there as possible. So really, just think of Big X, okay? It's a great movie. And, uh, but anyway, Declan, you're very, very welcome tonight. It's great to have you with us. And for those who don't know you, you're, you're going to be really impressed. So Declan, come on up onto the stage. Thank you. Thanks, Emmanuel. And um, there's me thinking I didn't need to go on the diet after Christmas. But anyway, Big X, here I am. Um, can you make kind of a slim version on that camera there, Mary? Can that work? Anyway, we'll see. Okay, uh, you're very welcome this evening. And I'm just going to say a few words, uh, a few thoughts myself, and then I want to go to a few quotes of Frank Duff. Just towards the end, I'm not going to go on, but there's some really, really rich stuff here. So, you know, just want to kind of tap into that if you can. Um, we're joined this evening by Father Brandon and the Immaculate Atta uh, Productions team. And again, thinking about what to say this evening, just as a kind of a starter, starter main course, and then a bit of discussion is dessert, okay? Anyway, Father Brendan has this program called the Brendan Option. And one of the points he raised recently was this upcoming synod. And he said, you know, we probably hear the usual stuff, lack of vocations, uh, more social justice, more women in the church, married priests, whatever. And I suppose that's all, to be honest, that's above my pay grade, really. That's, that's whatever happens there, happens there. 
But um, one thing I really liked about what he said was, um, and I, I'm not sure it will come up on the Synod, but it's the parish structure and whether it's still fit for purpose. This idea that you're rocked down to your parish and you're going to get uh, vivified and fulfilled, and I kind of have a doubt about that, to be honest, um, or how is it going to be done? But he made a suggestion, which I thought was really kind of good, actually. He said, you know, maybe we should be going back to the early monastic community kind of model, maybe Catholic hubs here and there. We know we have a few brothers here and a priest uh, from the, the Dominic Street community. And in some respects, maybe they have a Catholic hub going on. Father Brandon mentioned Knock as well. Uh, maybe that's an area that's something to tap into. I know we've got Simon here from Longford. I know the lads there, there's a men's group, 20 men, with Tommy Riley, and they're doing great stuff there as well, and Father Brandon Walsh. So maybe this hub idea isn't a kind of a bad idea, you know? And even this place here, this building here, is where Frank Duff... I'm going to talk about him later on. And Father Aidan McGrath, I was privileged to be at his last meeting before he died. Um, I'll come to them. But they stood in this room here and they sent out millions of legionaries around the world to go and try and bring people closer to Christ, closer to the sacraments, basically to come into the legion and basically to lift society, to be a leaven in the community. So just to think of that idea, as Father Brendan said, Catholic hubs, and it feels like a bit of a... Catholic underground here, um, you know, we're in the room together here and we're bringing Our Lady into the conversation. Here she is with us and let's see where, where it kind of goes to. Okay, you're welcome to this camp as anyone has said. It's the 100th year of the Legion of Mary. She is the commander, as uh, Brother Emmanuel said, and she's going to guide us um, to where we need to get to, which is heaven. That's what the game is. So there's a couple of points I'd like to just raise first in my head before we move into these quotes I want to read out. So again, this is a night of prayer, fellowship, discussion on matters of faith. They're really about life and death. Come back to this point of brother, Father Brandon said about the synod. He said he wants to see blood on the walls. <laughs> he wants to see passion. He wants to see people nearly fighting for the church because they're so interested in it. I thought that was a great idea. Yeah, we need a bit of, you know, What's all the specificity about? You know, we need to need to be sort of saying this is if so important. Well, then we need to talk about the church and where we're going to go. And I'm not, not expecting rows, lads. Don't worry, you don't have to get into a big row, but just to, uh, dialogue to sort of say, well, what's happening? You know, but the question I would like to raise simply tonight, if I was at the synod, um, is where are all the laymen gone? You know, I hear about this kind of table tennis game between clerical men and women in the church or whatever, Mary McAleese and the whole thing going on there. And I say, okay, I'm not a, I'm not a, a, a cleric. I don't particularly want to be a cleric. I don't want to be a nun either. And why, why are we kind of, what, what's this about really at one level? I sort of say, you know, where I'd like to know is, can we have a conversation about where are the laymen? And maybe there's something in that. Maybe there's an, maybe that's why we have a vocations crisis that laymen, you know, didn't really kind of, um, say enough, you know what I mean? I'm just saying, is there a blind spot going on here? Um, where are all the Catholic men, I ask? I don't mean men that do the collections at mass or cut the grass, they're important jobs in their own fears. But Catholic laymen that say, I actually really believe this stuff and I think it would really fulfill your life too. Not the type of man that when you call to his door, he says, uh, I, I'll, get her, I'll get herself. So let's just be clear here. Is it a case that you, you don't have a soul? You've no interior life at all? Are you so dead inside there's absolutely no thoughts of where you came from or where you're heading to? Your favourite football team is more important than the bigger questions. And maybe that's it. I don't know. You know, is that the view that religion really is? is that what it, are we kind of, is it for nerds, really? Are we kind of wimps? Or Simps is a word I heard, actually. My 19-year-old daughter said there's a simp is actually a modern-day expression used by girls against fellas. They sort of say they're so, they're so whipped. That's another word, actually. It's whipped. Um, that they, um, they're simps, you know? You know, if that's kind of language used by girls for young boys or men, I mean, really, it tells its own story. Anyway, I raise this issue because language is important, and Frank Duff will deal with that in the quote at the end, where he talks about, you know, what's what's it? Where is the, what's the image religion has? You know, is it something that's seen for? Well, you know, he's one of those. He's one of the religious types. You know, it's a bit of a loser, really. That's is that the narrative? You know, 
You know, do we need to own that a bit and sort of say, well, maybe there's a bit of truth in that, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's how far we've got, we've got that we're kind of, um, you know, that's how we're seeing really, you know, we can sort of hear people sort of saying, well, yeah, he probably, you could go out with him all right, but he's into that religious stuff, you know, it's kind of, you know, okay. I remember Christy May, he's not here tonight, he's in the Legion, he went to RTE and he had a big conversion and he joined the Legion and he had a great, great character and he was, uh, he led the riots on the Mount Joy roof and he, RT had him in and he said, um, you know, he told a story and Christy wouldn't hang back to say it was God that intervened and he had a conversion. And um, he overheard the RT producer say, yeah, yeah, that was, that was really, really good stuff, but just try and cut out that God stuff, you know? So, I mean, there's kind of a, we're being pushed back all the time and that's not today or yesterday, that happened. I suppose at one level, maybe it's the Father Ted-esque of Irish society. We're all a bit Dougal, are we? You know, kind of harmless Egypts running around. Mm. Kind of doesn't, uh, when I see the Sacred Heart kind of rug at the back of Mrs. Doyle's couch, it doesn't really lift my spirits, to be honest. And then I go into Mrs. Brown's Boys when I'm flicking through. I'd never watch it, but I just, there's the picture on the wall, the Sacred Heart. Everybody laughing, you know, you sort of say, well, I think my brother-in-law's grandfather, he got evicted from his house in Kerry, and the only thing he carried out of the house was the Sacred Heart picture. You know. You know, there's our Lord looking on with compassion, with a full heart, burning with love for every person that he's created, loved into their very existence. So I say it again, where have all the laymen gone? Do they all run because they're afraid to be seen as kind of losers or kind of doogles? Or to paraphrase Cormac McCarthy's book, made into a film, no country for old men, and maybe it's no country for a Catholic layman. Even in this film, we see the drama of good and evil, a play, the evil killer, Fabian, triumphs and killing all around him. Tommy Lee Jones, who's the good cop, retires and evil triumphs. You know, maybe that's, that's what's going to happen, is it? But anyway, anyway, that's Hollywood, and a life evil doesn't get away with it. God will have his say. And that's the second issue I want to raise. First is uh, where are the layman gone. The second is souls and salvation of souls and heaven. Okay, what's going to happen there? And where is this church that's meant to be saving souls? I mean, is it a chaplaincy? Frank Duff writes in one of his essays, is it a church saving souls or is it a chaplaincy? You know, where is the conversions? Bringing people in, building them up, uplifting them. We don't seem to talk about those things anymore. I just want to raise it there. You know, where's the assistance to save your soul? Or to, listen, we need to save souls. And we're not all going to cartwheel into heaven. Maybe we are, but I don't think so. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't actually make intellectual sense that it's all, it's not God, it's Santa Claus, actually, that's in charge. I mean, I, don't, I can't buy that, to be honest. I'm going, no, no. No, no, that's not a, you know, who wants to be kind of, that's, that's not the... Maybe that'd be very nice. Yeah, we'd all just get the nod. But I don't think it's as simple as that, to be honest. Um, I think we have to put a shift in, lads, really. That's what I'm saying, you know. There is a consequence of running away. And, you know, we have to kind of just see, ask ourselves that question. Well, where, where is my uh, shift? What am I doing, you know? So um, we have a duty to cooperate with our Lord and our Lady. And I suppose the question is, how is that duty going? How is the duty of cooperation going? And for people tonight... The Legion is one avenue. Is that the only avenue, though? Like, I mean, there's set up a men's group in your area. Do something for our Lord. Do something for our Lady. Just start a men's discussion group, a prayer group, adoration, a youth club, anything at all, to be honest. Like, the Legion ran youth clubs all over the city. Great if you can join the Legion, but if, it, if it's not your thing, fine. If you just, but do something to build up the mystical body, you know, because we have a duty to evangelize and do a bit of work. Sorry. That's the way it is. Um, we, prayer we just won't, it won't be enough. You know, as you can gather, I can watch, I watch a few films from time to time. My favorite scene in recent times was, was the box set Chernobyl. Basically, the, the nuclear reactor is, has exploded and is in the danger of thousands of deaths. They have no solution. The closer you get, the more contaminated you become. Certain death is for anyone near the scene. The suits are all running around. They don't know what to do. The white coats haven't a clue either. Anyway, the true story is that the reactor doesn't explode, but it's saved, it's contained. Good did triumph in this particular situation, and it happened in reality. 
It was interesting, though, to my mind when I watched it. The suits failed. The white coats failed. The only solution was to cool a mine under the nuclear reactor. And who did it? The toughest, roughest coal miners took it on. The scene is well depicted with these strong, foul-mouthed, but loyal and tough men took on the job knowing that there would be no reward. They would probably die in the process, but they were ready to make that sacrifice. They took it on knowing that it would impact other souls and families in Russian society. The first presidium in America was, were miners. I don't think they were losers or doogles. What's my point? Sometimes we need to get over ourselves and seek the good and the tough things in life. We need to seek hardships. We need to fight with our own capacity to constantly seek comfort and entertainment. We need to fight with ourselves as soldiers of Our Lady as well. She's expecting us to kind of put a shift in. At the last conference, Frank Duff spoke with the monks. Well, he didn't speak, but he was here, and we were quoted, spoke with the monks of the West. These are great Irish men, 4th, 5th, and 6th centuries, went out to Europe and preserved the faith in Europe. Europe wouldn't have, Christendom wouldn't have existed. They went out, I was reading about them during the week, St. Brendan was one of them, went out in boats without sails because they were seeking penance to row. This is our heritage. Frank Duff writes, the passion, the journey to spread the faith was the spirit. Cullum killed to Iona, Cullum banished to Italy, Brendan and so many others, many others all filled with this overpowering restlessness. These apostolic ones face pathless ways, uncharted seas, and all the terrors of the unknown. Their spirit was akin to St. Paul. They were hungry for souls and deliberately sought hardships, knowing that souls had to be bought at a price. So if you're going to make an impact, you're going to need to put in a bit of a shift. You know, you're going to have to buy with your time and your effort and your prayer. Souls had to be bought at a price. Before I conclude, I'm going to introduce you to a Columban priest who was in prison for three years in China. Now let's remember 40,000 legionaries were killed in China. Not because they're Catholics, but because they're legionaries. He died about 20 years ago. He stood in this spot here about two weeks after the Concilium meeting. I was in the room at the time. I didn't really know anything about him, to be honest. But he was suffered, and he was three years in prison in China. And they say a little bird used to come to kind of nearly give him solace. Anyway, he wrote a foreword to one of Frank Duff's books. I'm going to quote from the book in a second, but I just want to kind of set the scene. This is what he said about Frank Duff, and he had three years meditating on this, I suppose, in a Chinese jail. It would have been tragic if these articles had been allowed to perish. The accomplishments of their order are alone sufficient reasons for studying them closely. In them, he pours out his own spirit for the help of those who have joined the army he founded. They are living vital documents, brimful of zeal and confidence, treasuries of a practical wisdom and great experience. I regard these, the publication of these chapters, as one of the most important contributions to the Catholic literature of the century. It's my fair from prayer that be read and reread, digested and acted upon and passed on by thousands upon thousands of men and women. They demonstrate more than any other composition of modern times the possibilities to organize apostle of the laity. Their secret is that they are a verbal photograph of what their author has seen and experienced in action, and they spring from a soul on fire with active love of the Immaculate Virgin and her divine son. So I just want to pause there. This verbal photograph Frank Duff has handed on to us in his writings and his essays and what he set up. Much maligned, maybe, has been 1950s organisation, but I don't think so. A soul on fire with active love of the Immaculate Virgin and her divine son, he writes. So this verbal photograph idea is kind of interesting because actually over in the wall there we've got photographs of Idel Quinn and Alfie Lamb. You might know it, Idel Quinn worked in that building there. She went to Africa, died at 36, and set up thousands of branches of the Legion of Mary. She just wanted to give to Our Lady and to God what she could in her very poor health. Alfie Lamb is another man. He worked in that building over there, the Morning Star. Joined the Legion at 20, died at 26. 
travel all over Brazil and Argentina. They weren't hanging back. There was no cartwheeling into heaven. They put in a shift. Frank Duff himself was really into photography and he actually has this camera in the house next door where there's a statue of Our Lady standing. He glued it onto the top of the camera. So every photograph he would take would be kind of with her eyes on it. So I suppose this idea of photography, he seemed to be big into it, looking out over the world. That's why I referenced the, the films and the box sets and even the MacLeod productions and Brendan here this evening, Father Brendan here this evening, trying to maybe, someone out there might spark up something if they see the stuff on YouTube, um, the images, the drama between good and evil. So before I hand over to Father Brendan, I just want to fish, finish on one talk, really, and again to thank MacLeod Productions for their photography and creativity this evening. But I suppose was this final quote, which is probably, for me, one of the best things that Frank Duff wrote for a man. It's an essay on fear, and we're all full of fear, let's be honest. None of us are kind of, we haven't got it all boxed off. Um, but it was kind of so important that we put this quote, Father Colum and myself were talking about it, we put this quote on the, uh, my dad's missalette, really, you know. Frank Duff has talked about it. It's a long quote, so I'm not going to go into it. I'm just going to turn over here to the last kind of uh, page, or the last couple of paragraphs. He talks first about bravado and bravery. Which is bravado? Which is bravery? Bravado, if you walk outside an air... This is written during the World War II. So if you walk outside an, an air bomb shelter, or whatever they're called, um, um, is that courage or is that kind of foolishness? And he sort of said, it's, it's foolishness, you know what I mean? But if, you're, if you do it when it's your duty and you have to go outside, well, then that's different altogether. So he's talking about duty. And then he says, you know, so in, the, in the articles, people, well, why pick an extreme example such as bombs and airplanes? And then he said, well, our Lord was talking of a test. He picked out an even more extreme one. He specified the laying down of one life as the acid test of quality and love. Frank Dove asks, are you prepared to lay down your life for duty? So, so that's one thing come out from tonight, really. We're talking about fellowship, but we're also talking about duty as well. There's no such thing as a free lunch or free whack. No disrespect there, Mary. We'll get back in tea in a few minutes. But it's a fair point. You know, you need to put a shift in. That's what we're saying here. You can't go to our Lord empty-handed. Seriously, lads. You have to put in a bit of work. I'm going to finish on this quote of Frank Duff on toughness and gentleness. When we want to excuse ourselves for weakness in the face of fear, we take those references of venturing and laying down the life as a kind of pious talk, as counsels of affection which do not apply to us all. That is not so. It's absolutely essential to stand up and face whatever may be tired when there's a duty to be done and there's more than a personal duty. There's a duty on behalf of religion in general. It's of extreme importance that religion is a virile thing, a tough thing, in fact, though most people do not think that way about religion, he says. This is the line that kind of hits me, to be honest. And I'm thinking about the idea, the idea, the, the, the simps and the wimps and all that kind of stuff. He says, religion must be the toughest of things, and the people who are practicing religion should be tough, essentially tough. I do not mean tough in the modern American sense of the word, the toughness, I mean, includes, in their proper proportion, sweetness and gentleness. These latter must, of course, be, but they must be founded and fortified on strength of character. I cannot but feel there is an overstress in religion of the importance of sweetness, and that the impression exists that the strong things must yield to it. Not so. Take the brothers in the morning star mentioned a while ago. He picked those two saints, St. Jerome and St. Paul, because they were both hot-tempered men, strong of temper and strong of speech. They were tough men, yet because they were great saints, we can be sure that sweetness was a significant part of their makeup also. But toughness had to be there. If you do not see to that, they were earning for religion the reputation of being a soft thing that only softies practice. Ah. Oh. Just going to repeat that line. If we do not see to that, then we are earning for religion the reputation of being a soft thing that only softies practice. Okay, maybe there's a bit of Dougal going on there. We are creating the impression, and this is the real killer line, 
we are creating the impression that the legion of Satan are really the virile people of the world, whereas the opposite should be the case. Imagine how destructive to the interests of religion such a popular misconception would be. Its first effect would be the upstanding young people who place special value on courage would look on religion as effeminate, effeminate and would only practice it by stealth if they practice it at all. I'm going to read that last line. Its first effect will be that upstanding young people who place special value on courage would look on religion as effeminate and would only practice by stealth if they practice it at all. Maybe Frank Duff has something to say to us there. I'll hand it over to Brother Manuel to get the rest of the proceedings moving. Thanks. Uh, steering words, uh, Brother Declan, uh, very deep uh, and very much, you know, you, you mentioned the Sacred Heart, you're reclaiming the Sacred Heart. Um, that, that has become, yeah, it's almost like a, a comedic end piece in, in certain aspects of our culture. But our, our Lord, his heart burns with love for all of us, all of us who he has created and willed to love. So there's so many uh, rich points there, uh, Declan. And again, you know, you, you bring it back to Frank Duff and there, there's, there's many other... Um, writers that we can think of but for here i think it's appropriate in the centenary we're in a legion hq concilium and i think it's appropriate to, to focus to put a lens on the, the writings of frank duff and he's almost like the pathfinder you know he's he's given us all this information you know he's given us all this inspiration uh, you mentioned that movie no country for old men uh, we as you say no, no country for catholic laymen but there's a lovely piece in it where the the sheriff has a dream and it's his, of his grandfather and his grandfather is riding ahead on a horse and he's carrying a torch. And the sheriff can't really work it out, but as, a, as the reader, as the viewer, you think about it, it's almost like, you know, here he is guiding him, okay? So even though this time it seems dark, it seems brutal, you know, there, there, there is a light for us to follow. And sometimes we've we got to dig deep. You mentioned, you know, the, the saints, you know, from the, the fourth, fifth, sixth century that Duff was so aware of, but actually just reading the essays of Frank Duff, you know, a Dublin man who was profoundly inspired and, and look what he's achieved, look what he has encouraged, and look what he continues to inspire. So the mission template is here. It's up for us, really, you know, you're right. We, we have to put in a shift, you know, as layman. It's not enough to pray, and this thing, I'd say, I don't think I've heard softies, and maybe since I've read the Beano, I think it was uh, Walter and the softies, but he's spot on, he's on the money, and I think we have to reclaim this. And you, you men are here tonight, you're serious about your faith, you're here, you are stepping up, because you don't want to stuff it up, essentially. Anyway, like I said, there's a lot of rich points there, Declan, and thank you so much. Bula Busta Rishla, the whole. Now, I suppose uh, our mission, one of our missions as uh, uh, Catholics in this century really is uh, the, the digital continent. And uh, I'm delighted to say there's uh, to introduce Father Brendan Kilcoyne, who certainly has, he has, he has made land on the digital continent with the help of uh, Immaculata Productions. And it's a, it's a great, I have to say, as a fan of uh, the Brendan option, uh, I was trying to think what's the best way to describe uh, the experience of listening to uh, Father Brendan. And I recalled uh, a cycling trip I went on in France that didn't always go so well because uh, I decided in certain towns to taste the, the, the local, the Armagnacs and the Cognacs, which really, you're, you're, you're getting yourself into a lot of trouble, I have to say. But what I, have, what I really appreciated, obviously the tasting was always epic. Never let anybody fill up your glass though, that's for sure, that's not, that's not really wise. But was the description and the passion, especially local farmers, when they're describing how this is made, you know, the colour of the liqueur and all of the, the work that goes into it. And there's so much richness. And uh, that's what I feel, listening to Father Brendan, there's a, there's a richness to his content. It's obviously, as a, as a man born in Lewisburg, he's a, he's a natural raconteur. Uh, let's, let's be honest, uh, Mayo are single-handedly running the greatest uh, tourist campaign by not winning the All-Ireland, so keeping the focus on that, on that county. But like, as we all know, as a, as a fan of Mayo men and women, uh, co uh, my mum and dad come from that county. But uh, a, gr a great uh, gift with the words, but definitely there's, um, there's a depth there. And just to keep with the, the theme of movies, okay, because I think, uh, you know, we think of The, the Godfather. And I was thinking of uh, Robert Duvall's uh, character. And essentially he's the conciliary, but he gets sacked. 
Because they listen, Tom, it's not your fault. You know, you're just more a peacetime conciliary. But I kind of feel Father Brendan is more like Jenko. He's a wartime conciliary. So Father Brendan, come on up onto the stage. You're very, very welcome. Fill the bus, spread the hope. I'm following a very high standard. And I'm not just saying that. I really enjoyed all that has gone before. And I just hope I don't mess it up on you. Um, I'm very impressed by the turnout as well. Uh, who knew how extensive the Catholic underground really was? Um, I come from Lewisburg, as you were told, and uh, I'll probably hang myself with this story because knowing my look, somebody from Lewisburg will see this. But um, I remember a story being told uh, in our family. It was about a neighbour. He was a great guy, a very charismatic guy. He was a serious man. You wouldn't mess with him. A big family, he was a small farmer. Um, and um, he had just got married. This was when, long before I was born, he had got married and this was the story. And uh, his mother was a very, very strong person. That often happened in those days. And he married a very strong woman. And there was holy murder going on in the house. From, from just after the wedding. Because, of course, uh, the old people were living with them. That was quite common then. It was quite normal. And he was out working in the fields, and he came in for the dinner, which is in the middle of the day in Mayo. And uh, the two women were at it, hammer and tongs in the kitchen, showering abuse on each other. <laughs> and he stood listening for a while. And um, he didn't intervene. He didn't say anything. They were so intent on each other, they didn't notice him. And he put his hand behind the dresser, which contained all the lovely china in the house and the wedding presents, and he gave it a push. Knocked it over, smashed everything of value in the house. There was a moment of shocked silence, and then the two women turned on him and showered abuse on him. <laughs> and he went out the door with their imprecations following him. In a moment of sacrifice, because he would have to replace every piece of china in that, in that, and maybe more, he had brought some harmony to his home. He had secured, or begun to secure his marriage. He had made it clear that he would not let the family dissolve into fighting and squabbling, and that he was not to be trifled with. And he went back out. That's not a sexist story. He was a man. They were women. They were all strong people, great people, and they're all gone, I'm sure, please God, to heaven. Great people. I suppose what I'm saying to you here today is that approaching this synod and approaching things generally in the church at the moment in a spirit of adolescence, of, 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 of just reacting angrily, of uh, doing things just to get attention. None of that would be any good. None of it would be any good. It's going on already. Uh, it's been done, okay, for centuries. And I don't think that that particular tedious um, uh, tune needs to be taken up again, okay? But we may have to turn over a dresser. We may have to do that. Now, I admire that when it's done by a man who knows the value of money and who knows he's going to have to replace what's in it. I respect that. An Egypt just turning over the dresser for the sake of it, I don't respect. You know the old saying in the countryside? Any fool can burn down a hay shed. It took a man to build it. Yeah, building takes, building takes vision and courage and sacrifice. Now I'm talking to you here this evening and I'm going to tell you something that maybe some of you don't want to hear because there's a, even among, shall we say, the conservative group in the church at the moment and I am not entirely but a fairly conservative priest. Um, some of my colleagues would regard me as, as having even serious doubts about the Council of Trent. Um, <laughs> But I'm, a, I'm actually genuinely conservative. A conservative isn't afraid of change. A conservative respects its destructive power and learns to manage it. 
What's crucial to conservatism is you bring the best of the past with you. Remember your Burke, a great Irish statesman whose wisdom is there to be had if we would only reflect on him. One of the greatest parliamentarians who has ever lived, Edmund Burke from the Blackwater Valley in Cork. Well, he was a Dubliner, but his people were from there. Yeah, you bring the best of the past. You bring the best of the past. And then you can face the change. Then you can face it. You remember the great conservative trope, the uh, Aeneas in Virgil leaving the ruins of Troy, Troy on fire, and pious Aeneas. Why is he called pious? Because he leaves Troy with two things. He leaves it with his aged father Anchises on his back. He carries his father on his back. And in his hand is the little bag containing the lares and the panates, the little idols, the household gods of a pious Roman. Hmm? You bring the best of the past. Then you can face anything. And that's what we must do today. I'm telling you now, a few of you there are the finest of people and better Catholics than I'll ever be. But some of you talk sometimes and you're talking as if we can go back to this integralist situation is that, is that somehow this is going to happen again and throne and altar and Louis XVI will get his head back and all the rest of it. Well he not in this life he won't. A very holy man so please God he did get it back but not in this life. Okay. The revolution happened. We're in the Europe we're in. We're in the world we're in. Deal with it. Get used to it. You want a time again when, in the words of Joyce, the Christ and Caesar are hand in glove? They never trusted each other. And I was reliably told that Ireland was one of the few countries in the Second World War which routinely broke into the diplomatic bag of the Irish, of, of the Vatican Embassy. Cheerfully. I don't think Nazi Germany did. They never trusted each other. You think John Charles McQuaid and De Valera squinting at each other across the desk fully trusted each other. They were two brilliant, dedicated men. And they were both Catholic, yes, but he was the head of the state. And, and or he was, well, he was, the, he was the head of the government. John Charles McQuaid was the most powerful churchman of his time. Will you get this into your head? Don't be offended. I, I don't have long. I have to say this to you. Get this into your head if it's not in there already. You listening to me? We don't belong. We never did. We never will. This side of the grave, they will never trust us, and they're right. That's intelligent on their part. I congratulate them. Smart boy. They're right not to trust us. Cuddly Catholics. An absurdity. A real Catholic is anything but cuddly. You might as well cuddle a half-starved, bedraggled polar bear with a bad attitude and mildly psychotic tendencies. A real Catholic is fully alive. A real Catholic has two, has, no, not two, has, has, has some 4,000 years of tradition. And if you go back into the Jewish people, who spawned us because the Redeemer came through them? He is a Jew. All of that tradition is ours. Now, they won't like me to hear me say this, but I say it. We're their unacknowledged child, whether they like it or not. Do you think you belong with that kind of a heritage? Do you think you belong with the, with the Redeemer we have, with the Savior, with Jesus of Nazareth? The world hated him. It hated him, and it killed him, and it'll hate you. And it may well do the same to you. And I'm going to say something to you now. Frederick the Great once asked it of a crowd of soldiers he saw running away. Dogs, he said, do you want to live forever? Good question. He was a great cynic. Hmm? And I ask, I ask that. I ask that of myself. I ask it of some of my fellow priests. I, 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 look, I have nothing against safety, and I'm not getting Luddite on this, OK? The government did their best. Okay, I'm not going to knock on the government. They, I'd knock them plenty on other things, but they did their best. Were they right? We'll see. 
I think they did their best. But it was unfortunate to see some priests and some Catholics going around frightened. I don't know if you've ever seen the film Moloch. I can't remember the director, he's Russian. It's about Hitler and he's up in Berchtesgaden and, and the local parish priest gets an audience with him. And I don't know if this is true, it's a moment in the film, but certainly it's true artistically. And the parish priest has come in to plead for the life of a local lad who's in the army and he deserted and they're going to shoot him. And that stuff happened. I think something like 25,000 uh, German troops were shot by their own officers. And uh, Hitler's charming, as he could be. Hitler was very charming, he, if he wanted to be. He's charming and he's kind to the priest. And he despised priests, but he's kind to the priest. And then the priest asks him for this, and the mood changes. The next thing, Hitler starts shouting at him. And finally, because the evil, this is so artistically true, the evil often see more clearly. They often do. They do the good. Didn't our Lord say it to be? No, he didn't say it about the evil. He said it about the business community. I'm sure he didn't mean they were evil. But he said to the apostles, he said, look at them, look at them, look at them. They're up. They know what they're at. They know their business. They're wide awake. And you lot, you're asleep. The children of light are asleep. And Hitler says to the parish priest, I'm sick of you. I'm sick of you Christians. I'm sick of you. You never shut up about eternal life and you're all afraid to die. Interesting comment. That is such an interesting comment. In the film Downfall, and I hesitate to go any further, you really think I'm obsessed with Hitler. <laughs> and I'll confirm any number of stereotypes. In the film, uh, uh, Jordan Peterson uh, has a huge preoccupation with him. Hitler's a very significant personality for a whole load of deeply uncomfortable reasons. And he's a particularly uncomfortable modern personality. But anyway, in the film Downfall, which is regarded as historically very accurate, Joachim Fest, the German historian, commended it highly. One of the SS generals says to Hitler, but we can't do that. We, we, we've, we've lost so many men, and so many of the young officers are dead. And Hitler snarls back at him, and what else are young officers for? But that's true. <laughs> what does a soldier do? He offers himself to die. I remember General Sir John Hackett when he was head of the British Army. He was an author and a military historian, scholar in his own right. And, and he, he said exactly that. He said, he said the soldier primarily offers himself to die for his country, not primarily to kill, but offers himself as a sacrifice for his country. Our Lord was kind to soldiers, as far as we can judge. What else are young officers for? What else are priests for? What else are priests for? I hear all this talk among priests, and I don't mean to be disrespectful to my fellow priests. Well, I do, and hopefully I manage to get away with it. Because <laughs> I'm afraid of them. <laughs> so it's easier to say it when they're not here. But, but I mean, I've heard at meetings where priests are banging on and on. Oh, no, we need lay leadership. We need lay leadership. Aren't you the leaders? The lay people have to run the world. The lay people have to raise families. They're war out leading. We're supposed to have their backs. We're supposed to lead the church. And then, fine, I can see the point. Then, fine, yeah. You do need lay people active, very active in the church. You do. The likes of Frank Duffer, they're indispensable. But you see my worry. You see my worry, because I see a whole load of officers trying to scramble back to HQ and let everyone else take the flag. George Patton. You know what he was most proud of, the American general? He was posted up, the figures. The proportion of officers in his army who were killed was vastly, in proportion, vastly higher than the proportion of enlisted men. Patton was insanely proud of that. His officers led sacrificially from the front and asked for nothing they didn't do themselves. Mm, they weren't, and, and look, only a fool isn't afraid to die. I'm afraid to die. I'll tell you how to face death. Bring several changes of trousers. <laughs> because in the words, because in the words of the Duke of Wellington, a man should look well for the enemy. 
You should dress well for the enemy, okay? You don't want to let yourself down. If you need a few changes of trousers, bring them. There's nothing wrong with being afraid, so long as you do what you said you'd do. Because if you don't, we have a problem then. And now we come back to being a man. The world has decided it doesn't need us. Doesn't need us. We're big and we're thick and we're smelly and we're ignorant and toxic and we're, we're, we're violent. And as was rightly said earlier, no doubt there'll be a storm of anti-male uh, propaganda on the foot of this horrific death of that lovely young teacher. Let me tell you something. And here I echo the words of Edmund Burke as he talked about the Queen of France in his reflections on the revolution. Let me tell you something. For every man evil enough to do that to a woman, there are a thousand who would have died for her. I believe it. And and, and I would say that's every one of you. You don't think you would. But you would. It's what you're for. It's what you're made for. And I'm saying this to you here this evening. All right. We're coming into a crucial time in the life of the church. Now, the church is going to make a pig's breakfast of it. It always does. So you can take that as red. Because it's the church. And it wouldn't be the church if it did it well. We're going to make a hash of it. We started making a hash of it while he was still on earth. Just so that he could have a taste of it before he went. So that he could actually see what we were going to do afterwards. And we've kept it up. But... But it doesn't have to be a complete disaster or anything near it. And I'm not saying this to to Bishop Bash or or anything else. I I know a lot of the bishops. A few of them are my classmates in Manu. The the finest of guys. Okay? I'm just saying we have to take it upon ourselves to do what our confirmation sealed in us. To be soldiers of Christ. Do you remember being told that? Some of you are of a certain age. I don't mean old, but maturing nicely. Like an old port. Like a fine old cheese. (laughs) Ripening. No, no. You You remember this. It is absolutely crucial that we step up to the plate here. We don't belong in this society, and yet we are of it, and we, we, we must love it, and we must serve it. And we must do that knowing that we'll probably get no thanks, that we'll probably get no appreciation. Um, I'm not, I, I hope I'm not saying that out of self-pity. I am honestly trying to talk turkey here, as the Americans say, to get down to belt and braces. I cannot see a way forward for you that is not sacrificial. But the good news is that a man you're made for. It's what you're for. It's what young officers are for, as that evil man knew. The good ones weren't able to articulate. It's what you're for. It's what the priests are for. It's what fathers of families are for. It's what, it's what leaders everywhere are for. You're a walking sacrifice. And a sacrifice means something that is made holy by being handed over to the deity and consumed by him. Now, a way forward. Okay, because I know I tend to ramble on. So I'll, I'll try to put some sort of disciplined shape on this. A way forward. I would suggest that the first thing you start doing is that you start praying and doing penance for the church, okay, in Ireland. Now, there are a lot of things on our side, believe it or not, because even as this vast and unprecedented civilization has developed, it has become equally clear at every step that human beings cannot exist in such a gigantic society. It doesn't work. And as Burke said, what does us best are the little platoons the small associations. And so what you have is, an, I'm not the, I, I'm by, this isn't original. You have, at the same step as this incredible cosmopolitanism, you have a tribalization going on. So what's the whole identity thing about? 
is that it's not enough to be a citizen of the world. It never was. Who can be a citizen of the world? Only, only psychotics love the whole world without knowing any of them. The test is the ones you know. And, and to live a satisfying and fully human life, you must somehow get a bite-sized purchase on reality. Something that one can live in. And so you see, you see the identity politics going on? This is partly frustrated religion, frustrated attempts at transcendence, as is a lot of modern sport, by the way. I mean, this stuff is going on all the time if we can read the signs, as is a lot of modern music. This constant attempt, which now no longer can articulate itself at all, philosophically, theologically. Theologically, all right, yeah. Philosophically, no anymore, not as far as I know. The church itself is having to go back to Thomas, is having to go back to its roots. I... We have everything we need to do this. But it will be hard. Because we don't belong. Okay? So it will be hard. We have to start with prayer and fasting. We have to prepare ourselves for leadership. We have to prepare ourselves, that is to say, for sacrifice. We have to start with prayer and fasting, start with changing ourselves, and we have to go into the synodal process with the humility, with the mixture of humility and steely resolve with which my neighbor stood in the kitchen and quietly put his hand behind the dresser. We can do this one or two ways. Okay? But you must be willing to go into this synod and demand into this process and demand that the questions of personal sanctification, that the questions of active and intentional, proactive, highly professional training of cadres for, and I use the word deliberately, cadres, as the communists used to use them, for the work that we have to do, which, which is long and hard and complex to a very complex society. A society the prince pretends to be united in and is in fact highly tribalized, and increasingly so. A society which would have been at war ages ago if it weren't for nuclear weapons. I, 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 I think. Just look at the world. Yeah, we're all killed pretending we like each other. We don't like each other. <laughs> okay? Human beings are terrifying, brilliant and gifted and terrifying. Now, the only ones who can preach to this society, the only ones who can preach convincingly to the human beings are, are ones who identify with Christ and one way or another this society will kill you. Will it kill you physically? Will you be physically killed? Oh, no, 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 no. No, no, as we were saying earlier in a conversation, the West can teach the Chinese a thing or two any day. That's crude. That's crude. No, no, the West will kill you slowly. Mm, to be comfortable. And just slowly you won't get jobs, or you won't get this, or you won't get that, or you won't get invited to the parties, or you may lose friends, and, and bit by bit, because there are more ways to die than just physically. And social death is very hard for human beings because we're social by our very nature. Now, you, you can say back to me, Okay, I am finishing here. You can say back to me, we brought you here to give us a lift and you have totally depressed us and you've ruined our evening and please never come back. And I say, job done. Mission accomplished. Gentlemen, the situation is complex and fascinating and dangerous and desperate. It is ideal for men. It is ideal. And all that is wanting is that you be willing to lay down your lives and a few similar trifles. Yeah? If you're in for it, if you've skin in the game, if you're up for this, it, it's, there's no knowing what we can achieve. Because this world is not as sure of itself as it looks. I'm quite certain of that. There is nothing underneath its philosophy. Do you note how brilliant the world has become, this modern civilization has become at narcotizing its people and stopping them from thinking too deeply? Now, the two prophetic novels that were written in the first half of the 20th century, by far the more pr prophetic, and Orwell's novel was remarkable, 
and has given, you know, any number of phrases to the English language. By far the more remarkable was Aldous Huxley's novel, uh, Brave New World. If you haven't read it, have a look at it. In Huxley's novel, written in the 20s, the state actually d dispenses um, antidepressants, a very powerful antidepressant called Soma, which is available to all citizens free. Apparently, the German population and a lot of the German army during the war got by on a particularly powerful one called Pervitin. You see, <laughs> tyrannies are good at this. You narcotize it. The people stop feeling the pain. No, no. If you're up for it, it's all to play for. If you're not, let me ask you to do something. Okay? Go out tonight. Go drinking, turn to the world, abandon your faith, and stop messing around. Make a decision, one way or the other. Accept Christ or reject him. And then anything can happen. Even if you reject him, anything can happen. But this lukewarm messing that a lot of the Irish people are at is spiritually deadly. And it is no place for a Catholic man. Make your call. Make your decision. I leave you with Horatio. Do you remember this poem? It used to be on for the intercert. Then forth spake bold Horatius, the captain of the gate. To every man upon this earth, death cometh sooner or late. And how can man die better than when facing fearful odds for the ashes of his fathers and the temples of his gods? Um, Father Brendan, what, what, what can we say? That was, uh, <laughs> well, uh, I know, really. <laughs> um, yeah, you've, you've gone deep. I think uh, you're, we're here, let's be honest, guys. You're, you're here because you want to do something. You're here, you got some sort of nudge, you got some sort of prompt, something, you know, something drew you away from maybe, uh, you know, the pubs and uh, the converted sheds tonight. And you said, listen, let's show up, and let's see what happens. But he's laid it out. And, uh, you know, I was thinking it was a quote that Frank Duff likes. He said, um, I think it was Napoleon, there, there, are, there are no bad soldiers, just uh, bad officers, you know. So you, you put the cards on the table, you've pointed to the mission board. It's, it's all called out. It's all called out. And you're right, Father Brendan, you're made for this. We're made for this. And uh, it's like everything, it's, it comes down to commitment. And are, and are we going to commit? Are we, are we going to cross that threshold? Anyway, powerful, powerful stuff. And I know when this uh, recording goes out, there's a, Declan said it was the main course. Listen, this, this was a serious banquet feast, I have to say. Bula Busserishla, the whole Father Brendan. <laughs> Okay, because we're here, like I say, uh, our Commander-in-Chief, uh, Mary, so we're going to do uh, the Katina. So for those of you no not used to this, so we stand for the Katina, please. And I know the prayer cards have been distributed. Who is she that comes forth as the morning rising, fair as the moon, bright as the sun, terrible as an army set in battle array? My soul glorifies the Lord. He looks on his servant in her lowliness. Henceforth, all ages will call me blessed. His mercy is from age to age on those who fear him. He casts the mighty from their thrones and raises the lowly. He protects Israel, his servant, remembering his mercy. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and it shall be Who is she that comes forth as the morning rising, fair as the moon, bright as the sun, terrible as an army set in battle array? O Mary, conceive without sin. Let us pray. 
O Lord Jesus Christ, our mediator with the Father, who has been pleased to appoint the most blessed virgin, your mother, to be our mother also, and our mediatrix with you, mercifully grant that whoever comes to you seeking your favors may rejoice to receive all of them through her. Amen. Amen. So, Brother Bruno Mary, I believe you, you've been called up. So, we can have a special welcome for Brother Bruno, who was here at our last conference and made a wonderful contribution. Thank you so much, Brother Bruno. Yeah. Yeah. So, we'll just, um, in light of that, try and uh, concretize some of those great ideas that we uh, heard from Father Brendan and. Um, really see how it might apply to our lives Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. Because I think after a speech like that, we all just want to have Adam. Um, so let's see if, uh, based on like, all of our experiences, uh, the different ways, because I know some people have, like all of you gathered here tonight, um, we're already in the fight. It's not as if it's something ahead of us. Just turning up here tonight is a sign and uh, an action. Um, and I'm, I'm sure we all have uh, sort of knowledge to share about ways in which we can sort of uh, uh, take the fight now to, to, um, to, to get out there and to save souls and, and to, to labor for, la for Our Lady and for Christ. Okay. Uh so yeah, maybe just one thought that, that struck me from, from Father Brendan's uh, conversation was, um, like all of us here are, are, are willing to make, make sacrifices. Um, and as you said, a soldier is, is one who's willing to pay, put his life, um, that, that's his primary role, and lay his life on the line for his country. But we also know that soldiers, um, when they were being encouraged to head out to war, there was also the promise that there was something there, there was a reason to make these sacrifices. There was, as the, to put it in the old terms, spoils of war to be had. Um, I think one of the complaints made by um, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer in the 20th century was grace and salvation and everything had become cheap. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to make the sacrifice because it could be given to you. Do you see that as a, as a problem for us as we, as we sort of like inspire men to, to step up? Uh, I do, yeah. I'm, I'm particularly... Uh, my nephew is here tonight, and I have another nephew and two nieces, and uh, it, it's hard for the young Catholics. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that's becoming apparent is, is that you see to, um, to, to, to kind of make one's way in the world, because they have to raise a family as well. They have all this, they have all this crucial stuff to do. Um, they may end up having to avoid professions for which they're brilliantly... Mm. Um, uh, competent and see lesser talents get promotion. But this is going to be hard. I mean, any man or, or woman who's a bit of spirit in them, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're very good at what you do, you, you want a bit of promotion, you want to get, you know, you, you, you want to reach your full potential. And uh, there, there may well be an element of that. We, we may, for instance, I've been toying with this for a good while. Ten years ago, I'd have said to you, and I'm not sure I was wrong then. I'm not sure, but I, I'm just not sure I'm right either. Ten years ago, I'd have said, watch, follow the Jews. Mostly because of what we did to them. Let's call it. Mm. Okay, because we owe there, big time. Follow the Jews. What did they do? We wouldn't let them own land, wasn't that right? Mm. And we wouldn't trust them in the professions, or most of them. They couldn't teach, they couldn't do it. But... Catholics uh, had a huge problem with usury, so we let them do our banking. Um, and the, the Jews, and of course we blamed them for it later, became extremely good at it. Um, they're, they're remarkable people. Try to go into the things where you can't be put out of, that you can't be put out of just because of what you believe. Try to go into areas where if you're good, they can't afford to do without you. Does, does that make sense? Um, there are some areas in which no matter how good you are, they'll get rid of you. Mm. Because they won't allow you to be around if you're... If you're... Now, legally, they probably can't do this. But... 
there are hundred ways to skin a cat, like. And by the way, that's, I'm not telling you to skin cats, okay? Just, <laughs> we should be very careful here. Um, so on the one hand, there may be this white martyrdom. There may be. Mm. Yeah, I guess. A, a loss of being forced into certain areas, even if they're not congenial. Hmm. Simply because, I mean, I'm sure there were many uh, brilliant Jewish teachers, many brilliant Jewish uh, academics, uh, brilliant lawyers who couldn't practice, all this kind of thing. They, they didn't maybe particularly want to be working in those areas. And would you think, way to make a living. for men who already find themselves in certain areas, yeah. do you, and you're under these sort of, as these, these slow ways of being skinned, yeah. um, do you stay and fight it out in a, if you're in a research, if you're a researcher in pharmaceutical areas, or if you're in some of these as we sort of say, compromised positions now. Okay. Do you stay or do you think, right, I need to find a different niche? Like, okay. it's a very difficult. Yeah, and, and particularly so if you have a family. Family. Mm. That's difficult. And I, I, I do not say these things lightly. Um, it, it may be useful for you to try to find, how do I say this without it being misinterpreted? Or what the hell, it will be anything. <laughs> um, to find a less principled arrangement. <laughs> In other words, you see, if you're dealing with an ideologically, mm. and that's a lot of organizations right. now, you're in trouble. But if you're dealing with a crowd who just want to make money, then at least you can survive and feed your family, and tomorrow's another day. Do you see where I'm going? So I know much, some yeah. of you are shocked mm. at this. But look, it is time to survive. We are going to have to use our heads here, because you have to pick the hill you die on. You can't just go up for every fight, go up mm. for every ball. And, and um, do you want to get involved in an exhausting row early in your career? Right. I, 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 I'd pick love to hear more pick your, opinions pick, on Pick this. your battles, I say. Yeah. You, pick your battles. Pick yeah. your battles. Think of your family. Right. Be, be as cute as you can but, be without problems. Because there might also come a day when we need, we need men. We don't want to sort of surrender the ground too cheaply and have no. them. We're going to need men and, and Catholics in areas, l legal... Uh, medical research, yes. precisely because these are the hot topic areas and we're going to need Catholic men who can stand up and defend the faith okay. on a very important issue when the time comes. Okay, um, well I would say that it's going to be absolutely, you consider, right, you consider a Catholic academic, mm. we're going to have to provide places for them to yes. work and teach, right? Mm. Because they, they'll get thrown out of a lot of other places. Mm. And that means money, so make money. I know priests like to see lay people making money, okay, we hope we get a little cut. <laughs> but actually, corrupt as I am, and I'm pretty bad, <laughs> I do actually believe in what I'm doing, and I'm saying make money because we're going to need a load of money. You're going to have to, I'm saying this especially to the younger men, you're going to have to set up your own schools. You're going to have to pay your own teacher. We're going to have to set up uh, some third level institutions where are uh, at least to teach philosophy and theology where, where young academics can get jobs. We may have to set up a newspaper so the Catholic journalists can get to work. I, th right. This is difficult. I wish I could put a better right. spin on it, but. Right. But I do, I do have been said that you know, we can't rely anymore on the structures that have sufficed thus far, so let's be willing, let's be willing to uh, think of how new structures can work again. Again, we sometimes get, I think, trapped in the idea that the church has always been the way it was for the last hundred years, as if the it was always parish structures and things. And that's where, you know, awareness that early Irish Catholic church was the monasteries and the hubs, yeah. as you spoke about. Um, so I think we need, we can dare to think of new ways of doing things. Old Archbishop Mannix in Melbourne, uh, Corkman, as you know, uh, a great hero of, of Cardinal Pell. Um, Mannix was against Catholic universities, which is interesting. And Mannix was a frontier bishop, he was a, a former president of Maynooth. He, he just said, the modern university is going to be too expensive. Mm. You'll spend all your time fundraising and you'll sell your soul for money, mm. which a lot of them did. So here's another way of doing it. I think he advocated colleges on the periphery of the great universities, halls of residence, additional courses. Uh, interpretative and hermeneutic courses, if you like, so that Catholic students were equipped to go into these dens of iniquity and come out on the other side with their faith. Mm. Um, I, I don't know if you can think of better ways of doing this. We, our, our crucial problem is that we will not be welcome in many of these institutions right. and our young people will be victimized. So how do they make their way? Keeping in mind, 
that most of them won't become priests. They will, be, they will be, become family people and they will have to think of that at every step. I think, I think one, one thing to be thought of and, and um, Declan and, and Stephen can weigh in on this is that we often wait for top-down solutions to problems. Um, and I think at the moment, what we're going to look for is actually bottom-up. It's going to start small. It's not going to be um, a major sort of plan of action is going to come down from this synod, I think, and oh, once we get that, we can implement it and it'll be all solved. Yeah. Bottom-up, locals, local, local communities, yeah. new, new models of yes. um, community. Um, and there have been, there have been um, examples of this already. Um, yes. Like, I don't know if the, some of you can speak to like, ex experiences you've had of what this looks like on the ground, little, small, starting local ways of living the faith in community. Yeah, I just come in there, I suppose. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yeah, I didn't realise it was as dystopian as Father <laughs> Brendan reckons it is. Well, I'll but tell you what, if I'm wrong, good enough. Yeah, that's, yeah. I'm but like, it's, uh, it's better could to... Be, could be, and maybe it is, and uh, maybe it will be, and... Um, yeah. I'm probably just, I'm just like a little lamb there, dancing along to myself there, going, it'll be all right in the night. Anyway, um, hopefully, it, yeah, whatever it is, it doesn't matter, to be honest. That's why even with the COVID, and all, I'm going, what, what are you on about? What about your soul? Why are you getting no, worked up I about know, this yeah. stuff? What about your soul? I mean, what have you done for, for that side of the house in the last week? That's a question I just raised. I mean, it's, listen, that's the way you have to look at it. What have I done? And just... Just finish it. Uh, and there was one particular c case, and I know, you see, the Legion has this bad PR type stuff, but it's all about people who, um, not all about it, hasn't done itself favours, we know that. But then there is a kind of a, um, there's a, lot of, there's a kind of a, an influence that doesn't like Our Lady either. That's it. And then there's an influence there that really loves Our Lady and wants Our Lady. And we see this in the streets all the time. And again, my point is, and I say, you know, Frank Duff made a quote, and it comes to the pro-life, and I'm not having to say too much about that in, in so far as, he said, listen, it's great for Legion, Legion of Mary, Mary members to be, to be in the pro-life movement, um, or whatever they want to do, but do that as individuals, not as Legion of Mary members, and not for the Legion to jump in on that work. And you might say, why would you say that? Now, that's a bit of a... And he said, well, the reason is it's sort of semi-political at one level. I'm just saying what he said. Don't kill me. And the second reason, who's going to reach out to the woman who's made that decision or that whole mess that's come out of it, which has, you know, caused chaos in her life and maybe the family and everything else, the boy who kind of is... He's shoved to one side, doesn't even, you know, no decision... Like it's chaos from a kind of morale, moral point of view for everybody involved there. And so I can see Frank Duff's kind of, hang on a second, who's going to reach out to her? And that's really what I do think, that idea of fellowship, building up society, building up community. We have to, of course, fight those things individually. But I do think Our Lady has some sort of a plan regarding fellowship, you know, army, building stuff up, and that's what really what we're about. So. From our point of view, just to finalise what, finish out what Bruno said, yeah, we've had small victories. I'm not going to, we're not, you know, we're not massively changing the world. But in another, another way, in the same way as that rosary was said this evening, maybe it is St. Joseph, the terror of demons. There was power in that rosary. We go out on the Saturday morning for two hours. We just contact people. We talk to them. We give medals. Suddenly, 10 are out. There's 300 medals given out. You know, maybe say it's a big deal. And say, well, maybe it is a big deal. Maybe it's not a big deal. We don't know what happens with the, from there on in. But in some respects, we do know. We hear people come back. I had one particular case last week, Ian and Porrick in the room, they can vouch it. No big deal. But again, a woman came along. I started talking to her. And um, she was from Africa. And she had ch three children there, here. And she was homeless. But she was in a hub. She just said... Um, she kind of recoiled from the medal, really. And I said, how are you getting on? She says, oh, she says, I'm, I'm homeless. I have three children. And, uh, you know, she says, uh, uh, I've no one to talk to. That's basically it. I've no one to talk to. And then she started to cry. And I'm like there, OK, what do I do here now? I mean, this is kind of, she's in floods of tears. And it turns out we're just finishing anyway. 
And I said, uh, listen, we're finishing five minutes here, finishing now, she wrap it up, we're all going for a cup of coffee, do you want to come along? Didn't know if she's Buddhist, atheist, Muslim, it didn't matter, came along. Long story short, she spoke to us, her brother's a priest in Nigeria. And she just said, I've no one to talk to, she said, you know, that's the way it is. So my point is, we can, we can do lots of things, really, and just build up the grace now, so whatever comes down the road, we have a bank. That's all I can say, and to make that suggestion, reach out to people, there's lots of marginalised people out there, they need a lift, they need an uplift. We go and talk to them, bring our lady into their life. That's where our hands and feet, that's what the Lord wants us to do, is the mystical body. So we keep working that game. The other game is gonna, that'll kind of, we'll have to adapt to it, we have to bob and weave, but I think the Holy Spirit will help us, that's all I'd say. Yeah, it's kind of a, yeah, I suppose when you listen to us talk between it, you know, sometimes it's hard to get away from the negative stuff that you forget the positive stuff. I'm a, a couple of years younger than, um, the smelly cheese. The lads, but, um, but I always think of that, um, there's a line from The Simpsons, you know, where Ned Flanders' parents bring him to the psychiatrist, you know, and they say, uh, they're beatniks, and they say, oh, we've tried nothing and we're all out of ideas. And um, look, I, I'm, I haven't had a window into the church my whole life, but um, I feel like that was, my, that was my impression of lots of things that... Uh, there are so many simple things there, even Father Brendan pointed out that education and, and media and simple things that have been left by the wayside, people relying on structures that have always been there rather than being proactive and so on. And I was reading an article the other day, it was in the Wall Street Journal, and it was talking about South America, and it was talking about how Brazil especially was going to become majority evangelical in, in, in the next year or two. Yeah. And it's interesting because if we're talking about the synod coming up, um, you know, my spare time for my sins, I like to listen to some of the podcasts about the synod that some of the more liberal groups in the church are coming up with. And to be fair to them, I mean, look, they're talking about it, but you get people on it talking, and I hope people can understand where I'm coming from here. I'm not giving out about these people, but you get people who had been to South America as missionaries, and of course, obviously, we've with Af Afi Lam, who was a big success uh, when he went. But you have people who come back and they talk about how they had enculturation and you know, the, they mixed in with the culture and all these other things. And what kind of startles me is then they start saying, we should use these models as a model for our church here. And you kind of say, well, okay, but everyone's leaving that church over there, so why would we use that model? And there was a line in the article that said, the church became a church of the poor um, or the church reached out to the poor and the poor all became Protestant. And so you're kind of saying to yourself, well, why would we imitate that here? And I think uh, as Irish people, and probably not everyone in the room is Irish, everyone um, who might watch this after, but, but from our perspective in Ireland, like what Declan was talking about there, um, like I, this is, this is, like I've had people stop me on the street who were Protestant and asked me to talk about their faith. I even had, I've actually had Mormons stop me more times than Catholics. I didn't even know there's any Mormons in Ireland, but they, they stopped me more times than Catholics. <laughs> it was the only time, like I, I was going back to mass for a long time and I never had anybody approach me. And actually the one time someone approached me um, was actually someone asked me to join the Legion. And that was the only time, so that's, <laughs> that's why I'm here. But I suppose the thing is, uh, when I look at Ireland, you know, I think Frank Duff had an essay called The Mass, A Trilling Adventure. And Frank Duff was always caught up in this idea of um, adventurousness and entrepreneurship and, and excitement and risk in your life. And a few, weeks, a few months back, someone sent me a book. Um, it was called Last Words. And it was the, um, I think the OPW published it. And it, was, uh, it had all the last letters of all the Easter Rising leaders. And it was an incredible thing to read because it was the lack of fear that was in all of the letters and the sense of the fact that they were all so assured that what they were doing was right and the fact that they could see so clearly. Like Father Brendan was saying earlier, sometimes the evil see very clearly. Well, if people are really pure and rely on God, they can see very clearly too. And if they're willing, if they're willing to die, and they're willing to give up their life and sacrifice something. Sometimes you can see very clearly too. And I think 
of how quickly that happened, how quickly it turned that they had that ambition to do what they did, and then the fearlessness uh, before they died. Things are bad now in Ireland, but things can change very quick. And the Legion, I've only been around the Legion a few years, and what amazes me is how much like success you can have so quickly with people in terms of getting them praying again or getting them back to mass or whatever their own personal problems will be. So when Father Brennan was starting to speak, he said, you know, with the synod coming up, the first thing you have to start with really is personal sanctification. So you have to pray and fast. Then the other things come after it. And I think, um, you know, there's a lot of us here tonight and it's great. Like if you think, you know, four years ago when there was the, um, the Aztec, it was kind of an Aztec-like human sacrifice uh, ritual in Dublin Castle when they were celebrating abortion. You know, four years later, um, people are still together, people are still praying. And, you know, we have to visualize, if you think to yourself a hundred years ago, like Frank Duff wrote an essay in the 70s about how he thought that people in Ireland weren't going to mass enough. He said if you went to most masses during the week, it was actually empty. So we think there's something happened in the 2000s, but he says if you actually went to most weekday masses in the 70s, it was actually more or less empty. And he said the Sunday one was the big one, but he said, um, you know, cause he was, I suppose he was thinking in his head, well, you know, 100 years earlier, or 150 years earlier, he still had the penal laws or whatever. So, you know, this has been coming on 50, 60 years. And the thing about it is, it's been slowly, slowly rotten away. And that's how kind of the culture ended up the way it is now. But we, we have a lot to offer. And as Father Brendan was saying, like, there's no philosophy underpinning what's there. I mean, it's not like communism. Under communism, it's very hard to defeat it because there is a strong philosophy behind it. Um, but the philosophy that, that our society has, you know, just trying to turn us into a, a mini America or a mini, you know, whatever other countries, Starbucks, it, Starbucks mm. yeah, like that's, you know, that's, um, that's, that's not in the fear. That's not in the fear. We have something a lot richer to offer and I think we should be very proud of our heritage, very proud of, of the faith that's gone before us in this country. And we should um, you know, look, to, look to each other. And the, the big thing I think, as Declan was saying, the big thing I've noticed in the church is personal contact. Like even you guys um, being here tonight and, and having a cup of tea beforehand. And these are little things, but it's something we have to offer that the rest of the world doesn't. And it was the thing, about mass when, when mass was gone and people say I can watch mass online. Well, you know, you have to, you have to be there to receive the Eucharist when you can and, you know, so. I, I definitely, your comment there that we have much to offer, I think that's very true and we know that, but surprisingly, all those who seem preoccupied with the world, when you present it to them, they will know that too. So we were, in preparing for this conference, we were talking um, on the phone and we brought up that one of the great Catholic writers of the 20th century was J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, I believe it was the best-selling book of the century. Most of the people who read it didn't know that it was infused with Catholicism, but it was, deeply so. That's why it was so good. And the people were, all those people who read that were attracted to that, it resonated with them. And I think that's what we have to offer people. Even before we mention Christ, we have so much to hold out. Um, and that's the first step. I think we might say, like you, you talked about, we need to do spiritual training, we need to prepare. I think we need to sort of till the soil and fertilize it a bit before we plant the seed. I think we can all be very eager to go out and like mention Mary and mention Christ, but there is preparatory work that needs to be done, I think, yeah? Absolutely. I, I think, look, um, groups like Opus Dei are very good at this. They're, they emphasize it very strongly. In some ways, the greatest evangelization is just being really good at what you're doing and somebody discovering that you're a Catholic. Mm. Tolkien doesn't mention God in that whole book. Mm. And he didn't, he didn't, as you know, he didn't agree with C.S. Lewis yes. making, he felt... He felt it was a bit too obvious. Too heavy-handed, yeah. Too heavy-handed. Mm -hmm. um, but he was clear in interviews. It was Catholic from beginning to end, and especially in the revisions. It was consciously and intentionally Catholic. It doesn't mention God at all. I see that book has brought more people to God than we'll ever know, mm. you know? Mm. But obliquely, you know, right. starting from far out. Right. 
So I think we can take this. I, I, I'm struck by, you know, you were mentioning um, a brave new world, which maybe captured more accurately how authoritarianism mm -hmm. doesn't always take the model of communism. And like, so we might say like brainwashing today, you're not being strapped down in a chair and knocked full of drugs and, and played a, a reel of Stalin or something. It's occurring through the smartphones, through TV, through all the media. So I think before we ever have a hope of mentioning Christ or mentioning Mary, well, we're going to have to get our, our, our family members, our brothers, our, our sons away from the screens first and foremost. And that takes place by, it doesn't mean you have to take them to church, take them fishing, take them gardening. Um, like we're going to have to prepare our, our sons and our, our, our fellow men to yeah. receive the message. Yeah. yeah. And uh, a key thing about the, the brainwashing, it never stops. It really is. I, I mean, I do strongly recommend that that, that just if you've if you've time, sometime just fl just flick on Netflix. I think it's it's really quite astonishing, and it's the same ideology coming across to the extent that you have a film about Vikings and you have Viking bands led by women. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the references. My understanding is that the references to that in the Norse sagas are so Obscure. oblique, mm -hmm. that, uh, uh, but there they are. Right these right. terrifying women right. Right. <laughs> who are leading the way. And, and, and so women are put into places, and there's no need to do that to show how great women are. Right. But that's what's being done. Yes. There's no difference. There are no different. You iron out all the differences, but the differences are precious. But I think it's an important element. I think it's usually the first stage in most of the spiritual writers, St. Ignatius of Loyola and those, always talk the first week is always that sort of conversion. The conversion is the turning away from the world first. Yes, there is a turning towards Christ, but we have to be very conscious of turning away from the world um, and, and help others to do that first and foremost. Maybe also in, in thinking of, of training and preparing, what, what virtues, what, what characteristics of men maybe need to be most emphasized? I think at different points in history, different things need to be uh, valued. Um, certainly one that comes to mind for me, I think, is we need to cultivate perseverance. Yeah. Because there's no quick fix here. And anyone who sort of thinks, well, I'll go out and I'll strive, if he hasn't got a reserve tank there, it's going to peter out. We're going to be in need to be in this for the long haul. So perseverance is one. Is there other, other characteristics you, you see as needed? Or? A few weeks ago there, I went up to the, uh, you know, the men's rosary rallies up in, um, it was in Armagh. You know, we, we all knelt and prayed the rosary here beforehand. But there was something interesting anyways about the idea of having it out in, in public. I think men kind of have to be taught a little bit to, um, to not be afraid to kind of discuss their faith in public. But in, I think stuff like this helps you kind of interact with people in a, in a good kind of normal way that you're more comfortable doing it. Because I think especially if, you kind of, um, if you're new to it, sometimes you kind of want to blurt stuff out and you end up getting rows of people and so on and so forth, you know? But I think in terms of virtue, I think learning more about the faith yourself is a good way to go. So I think, like, I don't know about other people here, but you have the internet now and you have YouTube and you have a Fulton Sheen app or you can have whatever mm. and you can right. just stick those on. And th because that's the first thing people want to know. Why do you do this? Why do you think that? Why do you teach this? Do you know what I mean? So I think if uh, I'd say to people, talk to other people and half the time you're not going to be able to tell people the deepest answers but you can tell people like Declan said he met someone and she was crying or you can tell someone I was volunteering at the hostel and we this guy come in and this is how he was after it you know so I think getting out there meeting other people and uh, that helps you kind of hold your own in those conversations you know because because people will always always listen to that you know yeah just to come in there I think um I think these kind of events are important, to be honest. Not that we've done too many of them, but we're going to need this kind of stuff because people go, actually, I don't feel abnormal as I stand in the church on my own. I feel okay. They seem half normal. Brendan's a bit smellier than me, um, but that's okay. We're, we're getting there. But, I mean, we are normal. Like, I mean, we're just, um, we're just not buying. What's the public enemy, the band, the rap band back in 1989 or something? I don't believe the hype. And that's basically... We just don't believe the hype, and that comes to secularism, really, not going into the COVID thing, just saying, but we believe our Lord's hype, really. We believe our Lady's plan, our Lord's plan, and we're just trying to keep a third eye on it. 
and the world wants to distract us all the time. And that's basically the game, should we say. So we have to say, turn off the phone, turn off the Netflix, get into the car, give my daughter, my, one thing I do, I might give my daughter a lift, but I say a few decades of the rosary, just keeping the prayer tipping over, you know, just keeping at it and not an overly forceful way. I'm, not, I'm sure she might even, you know, she'd be embarrassed even, even saying that maybe, but, you know, she's 19, you know, she's, uh, She's not saying, she's not running out the door, like she's, we're, we're, we're talking. And I think that's it, you just keep talking and asking questions. That's one thing said, someone said about a dinner party conversation. If you ask a question, you, you dictate the, the, the conversation really, you know, and I think it's worthwhile raising questions. Not in an overly, you can't say, listen, I want to talk about Jesus now, do you mean, but you know, What's going on here? You know, where is the, what's the purpose of this? I met, I went for a walk last week with a neighbor of mine who's probably agnostic, atheist, I don't know, he's searching anyway, and um, 52, 53, you know, and he, so I actually gave him that quote, you know, I said, religion is tough. He says, so, so what? I said, religion is tough. And it should be tough, I said, it's meant to be tough. Well, wh wh why? Because you're trying to save your soul. I'm only quoting Frank Duff, but is it, this, is, this is a big game here. So it's not going to be that easy. So you need to put a shift in. And he's looking at me going, okay, I never, no, no one ever said that before. I said, yeah, that's why. It's, it's not that easy. But it's great. It is a great adventure, like a trillion adventure. It is a great, it's a fulfillment, the, the whole thing. Like the arts, drama, film, life, death. We can face anything, you know what I mean? And then I look at people who don't have it, and they're, they don't have a go, like, but it's kind of fairly two-dimensional, you know what I mean? Where am I going on holidays? Or that's rolling from one situation to another, which is, listen, that's their thing. I try and encourage them to say, listen, there is more to life. You're made for more. Mm. Get in the game, you know what I mean? This is important. You've only got one life. Time has gone by. They say land is precious. <laughs> Father Brandon would know this. You know I mean, they're not making any more. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. Well, I add in, they're not no. making any more time either. Right. No. You know, you've only got one one go at this. So you know, make it make it as generous as you can be, and make it as positive as you can be, and smile. Actually, that's another one. Father Michael Marr used to say. He came to a Legion conference years ago. He said, "Smile, give your face a holiday." <laughs> <laughs> you know. Let's have a laugh. You had a great podcast before Christmas. Catholics like to party. Yes. That was a great one. And no. in fairness, I won't go on to back to that, but I just say, we, you know, we are very normal. We'll have a laugh as much as anybody else, more, more so. So you have to have a bit of, uh, bit of a smile, a bit of a humour. There are funny things happen. Funny things happen in Legion and stuff as well, to be honest. And it's just, you just laugh really at the world in some respects. And just, not like in Egypt, but just kind of go, you know, Listen, we've got good news here. We've got the spirit. We're doing our best. We're plugging along. We're showing up. We're turning up. And we're just doing a bit of work. That's it. Uh, I'd, I'd follow up on that ju just because that's excellent. But just, just add to it, um, study. Know what you're doing. Know what you're talking about. Duff was a great studier. Mm. All mm. his life, as I understand it. And mm. the handbook was written by a man who had a serious knowledge of theology. But Duff was a first-class civil servant. That's often forgotten. He was civil servant under the Brits and later under the Free State. He was excellent mm. at his work. Um, another thing is, and following on from what you're saying, or to repeat it, develop a sense of humour. Uh, human beings all over the world, there's nothing like laughing with somebody. Not at them, but sharing a laugh. To share a joke. And the, 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 the guy or the woman who can... The, especially to be able to face life, because it can be tough, but to be able to face life with a bit of, a bit of style. Mm. The Italians used to call it sprezzatura. Sp it's a great word, sprezzatura. It was the ability to face any disaster and make a joke about it. Light a cigarette, <laughs> you'll have that. <laughs> the house right. burned down like the hay shed, everything right. gone. <laughs> But at least, thanks to God, you still have the fags. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I think the best Catholics I know, that's, they're attractive personalities. Yeah. People are drawn to the saints. Even, you know, Padre Pio, they said, could be a holy terror in the confessional. Yeah. But people were drawn to him. There was something attractive about him. Yeah, yes, and I think, let's be the people 
that people want to have a coffee with or stand at the water cooler with and chat with because that's how we'll start to communicate the faith to them. But they just want to be around us because we're attractive personalities, because we're fully alive, fully human. I think that's, I think that's where we begin. Yeah. I think that's where we begin. You know, um, I was thinking, maybe just one point, we're, we're all we're, we're here for Our Lady. Uh, many of the men here are, are men of the Legion. Um, they're dedicated to this woman in their lives. Um, and I, I sort of agree with you. I think I'd be confident in saying that there's not a man in this room who, if he wasn't at that, if he was at that canal during the week, wouldn't have laid down his life yeah. for that woman. Um, and so I think it can be sometimes more obvious how to die for someone. Yeah. How do we live for the women in our lives? There you go. Um, I would argue back, okay, I'm speaking as a celebrant priest now, but I, 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 would, I would argue back strongly is that men need... You see, Christian civilization, and all right, to an extent that did exist once, Christian civilization gave us something that civilizes the war between the sexes. <laughs> because they're two very, very different ways of being human, and yet both human. You know, they're complementary, but there's, there, there's a jar. It was chivalry. Mm. It put manners on men. It taught them to behave themselves and to revere women and protect them and reverence them. And I, I'd say go back to that again. I, I can't understand. I mean, again, just speaking like, you know, because uh, I'm not saying I'd have been any good at it, but I had to give that side of life up. And I can't understand a man who doesn't buy his wife flowers or some clown who goes, goes abroad and comes back with some stupid present instead of spending money he doesn't have on some expensive perfume. And of course, she'd give out to him for a week, but she'd love it. Right. I, I don't know, I, 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 just, I, just, I just, I envy married men, and for God's sake, will you just, you, you have your wife not to love her, you have her to adore her. Okay, she is to be adored, showered with presents. Okay, I, I, I'm just saying, what do I know? Just a stupid little maybe, priest, what maybe, do I know? Maybe, maybe we'll, we'll ask the married man with the 19-year-old daughter, how do you... <laughs> Yeah. You concur with that? I'm going to stop on the spar at uh, a service station on the way home, pick up <laughs> flowers uh, <laughs> and chocolates and the whole lot. Uh, your question was, how do we live with women? Is it? No, how do we live for them? I think it's, we often imagine that we would readily die for them. How do we live for the women in our lives as men? We like, well, I think it's really important. One thing, actually, really, uh, I, I'm slightly digressing here, but uh, I met the head of a prominent congregation and her, my daughter was in her school, you know, and she said, oh, yeah, she was academic, fairly uh, academic school, you know. And I said, you know, it's great that the academics are kind of high there. I said, yeah, but, um, you know, not everybody can become a lawyer or a, a, or a doctor. And she kind of looked at me, this kind of quizzical nun, you know, kind of, well, what's that about? I said, well, not everybody can, like, I mean, what about motherhood? <laughs> And she kind of jumped nearly when I said that to her. And I said, well, I know that, you know, it's not something that's on an, an 18 or 17, 18 year old girl's radar, but if it's not proposed out there as sort of a, a, a way of fulfillment in life, um, well, maybe that's something that needs to be taught about. And, mm. you know, at the end of the day, if we don't have mothers, we don't have families, and we don't have a, we don't, a domestic church, it's a family. So um, I think that's one thing that could be kind of highlighted and I would be talking about that at home. I'd be saying, yeah, careers and job, fine, but, you know, meeting the right lad is really important, you know. That's really, that's the A game in, in my head anyway. I'm not just sure it's in her head or my wife's head. Going back to the wife question, yeah, I think respecting motherhood is important, to be honest, and their role. They have, they're serious operators. I mean, we're only here. We're not, this is man up to help women. That's what we're really... This is what this is about. They've carried a lot of the load, really. Mm. Like men, even like that idea, like I'll, I'll go and ask herself, you know what I mean? Mm. Tom said it last month when someone came around from the pro-life, he did work pro-life work, and the fella at the door, he said, um, uh, what way are we voting to the wife? You know what I mean? Sort of as if, you know, come on. Have you not got your own kind of ideas uh, in relation to this sort of stuff? So what's my point? My point is... I think you have to respect motherhood, respect women. And like that whole chastity area is a real problem. 
And like a lot of it, the men are really letting down the women, you know what I mean? I don't care what anyone says, but... I sat one day at a, at, a, at a meeting, actually with the same nun and a present bishop, to be sure her name nameless, and we were moved, going into the meeting, the Department of Education, and I was sitting there at the Gresham, Toddy's Bar, and there was a couple going by, and they were holding their hands. So that's interesting. It's Con Street here. It's not really the, the Sean's Elysee um, um, for, ro for romance. And then another couple went by, and she was holding they were holding hands again. I said, OK. Ten minutes later, I'm a bit bored now, listening to the present bishop and the nun yapping on here, so I'm kind of watching out the window. And I see another couple, and I said, yeah, this must be a couple's convention. What? Or is it the Jehovah, Jehovah Witness? Sometimes they're very, obviously, couple you know what I mean? They're kind of, they're very clean living, and they're there, and I kind of, oh, maybe it's a couple, you know. And I'm not joking, then I saw another couple go by, and then I was looking at the faces, and I seen kind of a, maybe a good-looking South American, Brazilian girl, maybe, with a, an Irish lad there. I said, what's going on here? And I was looking at the Irish lad's face, and then when she, she went, his face kind of fell, and I said, bang, I've got it. I was in the Gresham Hotel, and Planned Parenthood was next door, or whatever, family planning clinic, and whatever it is. That's what's going on. They're getting this sorted. And there's the fellas, and, you know, let's get this sorted. So they're the ones that really let down the mothers as well. Maybe didn't have any choice, all that kind of stuff. I'm not having a go at it, but, I mean, I'm just saying it. That's, uh, it's a... It's that drinking, GAA, culture, drugging, whatever it is. Not even drinking anymore, it's kind of drugging, isn't it, really? So, I don't know. I think there's a, there's a bit of responsibility there. The lads are letting, them, letting the, the, the girls down, I think. I, I think there is maybe an element of, we feel like it's not our area anymore to say. Like, you, you know, well, I'm a, I'm, I'm a member of the clergy. I, you know, maybe I should be talking about this or... I'm the man in this relationship, it's a woman's <coughs> issue, yeah. we shouldn't say anything. I think, I think we need to get over ourselves mm. and, and face up to the fact, yes, we may get some flack for it, but if it's the right thing to say, if it's the soul worth saving, say it, do it, uh, be chivalrous. You might be sort of spat at, well, maybe not spat at, but uh, scorned, uh, told you're old-fashioned in a thousand different ways, as you said, that they can maybe demean you. But if it's the right thing to do, if it's the way to be men, then let's do it. And, you know, for every I, time you, it, it, it won't work, there'll be that one time where it will. And won't it be worth it to have saved that one, yeah. the one soul or something? I would um, I'd seriously question a lot of the mentoring that goes on as well. Mm. Is, um, I don't know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really have much confidence in it. Uh, spiritually or morally, to be honest, to say the least. But fine, there's, there's nothing we can do about those organizations. We can do, do something about ourselves. It's, it's the, key thing, the key thing with a man is that, as to you, you know, the American phrase, he's a promise keeper. Mm. Is that he's faithful to his wife. You know, is, is that he's faithful to his wife. And, and look, I, I remember saying this to classes as a priest. I said, you know, you get married to this beautiful girl. What if she gets sick? It happens. Well, well, what then? Well, you just get rid of her. You just walk out. What if she, she loses her looks? What if, what if she ends up in a wheelchair? And you've, I've seen this. It happens. But to real people in their lives. And so the, the romance I'm talking about costs everything. Mm. But... Right, I like the idea of being, being a man of your word. Well, yeah. we should be men of the word. Yeah. Um, and even more so. Um, ab ab yeah. Absolutely. I, one of the things that worried me about the church during COVID, we weren't doing anything crazy for the most part. The, there, there's no creativity. There was no imagination. There was none of the richness and creativity that characterizes Catholicism mm. sporadically through the ages. We weren't doing anything really daft or almost or dignified to try to make sure that people could get mass. I mean, hardly anyone was coming up with... I'd have loved to see a bishop come up with some totally ridiculous idea. But, you know, but, just to make sure that everyone could get mass without, right. without trouble, right. like, you know? Right. But, I, I don't know, we... We managed it very safely. And again, look, it's not... I mentioned bishop. I'm not getting to the bishops. I, the priests, more so. 
we, we managed it very safely, very efficiently, but the romance has died. Mm. Uh, if, <laughs> and I don't want you to get nervous. <laughs> but uh, if, if I were the lady, I wouldn't be feeling the love. Mm. I'll mm. put it that way. Mm. Now, OK, there are exceptions to that, in fairness, because some priests really went the extra mile. But I just didn't see enough, um, enough of us in the priesthood saying, I'm going to keep my word. Right, those are the rules and I'm just going to find a way, no matter how stupid I end up looking, or how close to sacrilege and blasphemy we end up going, I am going to get mass to God's people. Mm. If they want it, mm. I'm going to get mass mm. to them. And I didn't see that happening mm. much. There were bits and bobs, but I didn't see it happening. Mm. And I, I thought to myself, right. Crikey, but uh, maybe that, 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 that attitude is needed across the board in various different, for the layman, the word you made at the altar to yeah. your wife, the, um, how many men have been godparents yeah. to their, maybe it's their, maybe it's not their own child, maybe it's their, 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 their niece or their nephew. Yeah. You said something at that baptismal font. You did. Like, however outlandish way you have to go about getting the faith into your niece or nephew's life, try all the tricks in the book, but try something. My, yeah. my grandfather, the Lord to mercy on him, was a tough male farmer. He was a World War I veteran. Although his friends used to accuse him of hiding in the kitchen. He was a cook, corporal, or sergeant, I think. If you, and he could swear like a docker, but he never blasphemed. If you took the name of the Lord in front of him, he was a short man, short, thick set. He'd take off his, you know the flat caps they were? Mm. He'd take mm. off his cap, he was bald as a coot. He'd take off his cap and he'd stare at you until you stopped using the holy name. Mm. Then he'd put the cap back on and he'd go on talking as if you hadn't talked. That's male piety, boy. Mm. The only ones now, the only place now you'll see that is with, is with the Muslims or some of the Orthodox Jews, the Haredi. That's about it. It's the real male piety and, and the romance and everything else is... I, I, I think something in it is lost. And, and when a Catholic m man is no longer proud right. to kneel before his God, right. then I don't think, uh, I can't see him being much good of a husband either. Do you know what I mean? There's no, there's no daft romance and sacrifice in him. It's died in him. Something has died in the guy. Right. Jeepers, you, you'd hardly blame her for taking the road, right. like, you yeah. know? <laughs> But I like, I like that example especially because it shows, you know, how many homilies and sermons have you forgotten I know. that you don't remember? I know. You wouldn't, you know, great, great spiritual teachings in them, but it's all gone. Yeah. That one moment by that, uh, by your grandfather taking off his hat, that's embedded in you. Yeah. That's the, that's the way Catholicism will be handed down. And that's the way every man in this room can do that. He doesn't have to get up and give a, give a homily or give a talk. But little gestures, your, your, your sons are watching, your grandsons are watching, they're taking note of it. And they will remember it when they're 30 and 40. Um, I used to see the old men praying in the church when I was a kid, and the men were on one side and the women mm. on the other. That continued for some time, as you, as you, you, you don't remember. Heard, but heard it stories did. about it. It yeah. did, yeah. Oh, it, continued, it continued into the 70s. And a lot of them died out in the 70s. And they'd rock back and forward praying. And you'd hear them, because they were used to the Mass being in Latin. So they'd just bash away themselves. And you'd hear them every so often, Oh, my Jesus! And you'd think somebody was after him, dying at the back of the church. And no, he was only halfway through his devotion. <laughs> they, were, they were phenomenal. Do you know where I saw that? The only time I saw that as a, as a grown man. Because they, they died, mm, as I mm, said, out in the mm. 70s, that, that, that old generation. Mm. I, after I was ordained a deacon in Rome, we got into John Paul II's Mass. And it was the only time after that I saw a man pray with his whole body. Like John a man. Paul. And John Paul was there. Oh! <clears throat> in the seat, and he had the rosary beads, and he had a pile of posties with names written on them. People would ask him to pray for them. The whole thing was chaotic, like, and he was there. Jeepers, he was dogging into it. And he was an athletic man, you know. He still was, that was about uh, two, that was um, 91. And all right, you know, mm. he's had his health trouble, but he was still, still a vigorous man. He was yeah. still a powerfully built man. And every so often, hallelujah. <laughs> and he sort of settle himself in the chair and get, <laughs> and I go, this guy's serious. <laughs> I was so proud of him. 
I was, I was so proud for my relations to see him. And he was praying like the old men used to when I was a kid, and I'm sure they did in Poland, because I think a big influence on him was the local tailor, Jan Tiranowski, who was a mystic. He was kind of very, very like Duff, except not as well educated, I think, maybe. I don't think. So, look, I, I think it's doable. I think it's doable, but we have to work out a way to do this as men. You know, I'm not coming across with any macho nonsense either. I mean, it's what we are. It won't, nothing else is convincing. And our piety is too feminized. And, and um, the hymns are too feminine. And I'm not getting at women. A woman is a woman, a man is a man. I, I just, men need a hymn that you can roar. You know, um, battle chant, yeah. you mm. need something that you can dance with the tribe to, like, you know, that you can roar. I, I, I remember a friend of mine telling me he bought a, he bought a set of knives in, in Rhines in Galway. And the guy in Rhines started laughing and he said, do you know, he said, I can never sell those to women. He said, the only people who buy blocks of knives and iron pots are men. <laughs> he said, the women wouldn't be bothered because the pots are too heavy. <laughs> But he said, a man mm, would buy knives yeah. and a pot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and his ideas run out after that. Yes. <laughs> and we, we, we have to do this as men. I, 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 we do. We have to rediscover it and, and develop a new male piety for a new age. So maybe one last question then. Um, just you, you mentioned there we have to do it as men, but I recognise that maybe in our eagerness and maybe the fact that we've lived so long under a feminised church and a feminised culture... Or, we're not sure. Maybe our role models did die out. The, the generation passed, maybe a lot of them. Um, so the danger of pitfalls. What, what are the potential pitfalls? Uh, are there any that immediately crop to mind? Things to avoid maybe that, that you know, in our, in our earnest efforts or in our zeal that might trip us up accidentally? We sell out to the world and we adopt models uncritically uh, that are admired by the world. So the macho thing, that's not worth a damn to us. And it's a, an immature adolescent right. thing anyway. Right. Uh, there's much more to being a man than that. I, 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 I think we have to take a critical attitude towards, towards those models. I, I, I think that's, that's certainly an issue. I, interesting the way the Catholic schools have foundered. Um, the very name they've got for, for being excellent has been the ruin of them. Most Catholic schools are first class. They're excellent at getting people into the professions, into the thing. Mm. They're supposed to get you to heaven. Mm. There's an old monk in Ampleforth, a past pupil of Ampleforth told me this, you know the famous school in England? Yes, for the conference. An old monk, he, the first time they were asked at the headmaster's conference in England, a very, very upper class affair, Eton, the whole bit like, and finally they were asked to it. And they were asked to say in one word what they were producing their students for. And they went around the table, around the, the room. And they were all saying, you know, service and duty and all the rest of it. And this little monk got up and he said, death. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true. Right. That's true. But our, our, our schools have become... I'm not getting at teachers, by the way. I'm not getting at... This is huge. It's bigger than any one person or group. They've become worldly. Mm. They're not crazy. Mm. They're not funky. They're not... Am I making any sense? Yeah, no, that perfect. Yeah, no, it's, a it's Catholic a school should be a weird little place. Right. No, but it should be full of creative right. people, artistic, scientific. It should, should be full of briery, difficult little people. Because you know? we don't belong, as you said we earlier. Don't we don't belong. And our school shouldn't belong, and our hospital shouldn't belong, and our, you know, our families, in some sense, shouldn't belong, because they're not of this world, ultimately. I remember when we still had the boarding in Jarlitz, we were at a priest meeting. We lost it in 05 one of the oldest boarding schools in the country. And uh, a few priests, a few of us were, went for a, a cup of coffee afterwards. And, and some, we were in a pub and one of the priests had a pint and he's a poet. He, no, he, he died lately. He was a pub, he was a poet, a real intellectual. But he was there sipping his pint. And he asked one of the priests who was in the college, he said, so how's the college? And uh, as every Jarlis past pupil asks, you know, how are things in the college? And, and he said, oh, good, he said. Gee, he said, we, we're getting the right stuff, he said. We're getting fine, solid guys. And your man put down his pint and stared at him. Safe, solid people 
build safe, solid, suicidal societies. And he picked up the pint and started drinking it. <laughs> well, my friend was fit to chew the stuff. Because the work that goes into a boarding school. But he, he was right. Catholic schools should be a bit crazy, you know? But we, we saw, this is it, selling out. That's, that's my biggest worry. Sorry. Um, gentlemen, any particular worry or concern? Um, Closing comment even. Well, I was just going to say, I heard, I heard Father Brendan speak a few months ago, and he, I don't know if he remembers making this comment. He got excited then, and uh, talking about schools, and he said, because he was talking about the industrial schools and so on and so forth, and what he said was, I don't know if he said this in jest, but I, I thought it was a very good comment. He said something along the lines of, he would love to give back all the best schools and take some of the most difficult ones and then really show what Catholic education was about. And yeah. uh, I think that's very true. And the safety thing, I mean, there's people who run this country now who um, you know, can't stand the church, go against the church in every way. They went to the best Catholic schools, you know? And so sometimes you just need, you just need a spark. It, it, like Fulton Sheen said, if you want your child to lose their faith, send them to the Catholic school. If you want them to learn to fight for their faith, send them to a public school. And so, you know, we're, we're blessed. In one way, we've lots of Catholic schools, but in some ways... I hadn't ways, heard that quotation. That's excellent. Yeah. That's very interesting. In some ways, it's, it's almost counterproductive, you know. So yeah. we ju that's, where, that's where a bit of um, education, a bit like self-education and a bit of spiritual... Discipline comes into play to allow ourselves to see that clearly and to, to actually say, OK, well, if we have to give up X amount of schools and do it for a purpose, not just say, yeah, take the mm. schools, we don't mm. care. Because that's, that's what some of them are saying now, just take the right. schools, take them off our hands, too much money. But if we kind of say, take the schools because we are going to go all in on these schools or right. this plan of action, that's the way to mm. do it. And it's like the guy with the thrown over the China Cups, you know? I mm. mean... We know the China Cups of, of the education system in Ireland are going to break, but I think we just have to uh, you know, do it for a reason and have a plan of how we come out of it. Because, mm. um, you know, it, as we said, in most countries, people would want to go to a Catholic school anyway. So there's no mm. need to fear. And it could be a very exciting avenue. And to go back to, I mentioned Parik Pierce earlier. Mm. I mean, great, a great headmaster. Great he, he was, yeah, he was, he was a visionary and he was... Um, mm really thought outside the box. And so I think um, that's what we always have to offer. We're, we're always the, um, you know, the, the, a few years ago, I'll just finish on this real quick. A few years ago, there was um, an event in New York, in, in the Met Gala in, in New York, and it was a fashion event. And lots of people were giving out stink because a lot of the celebrities were dressed up in stuff that was influenced by the, the Catholic imagination. And so people thought it was meant to make fun of us. Now, Cardinal Dolan actually went and I'm, I'm pretty sure people are giving out about him going. But the idea was supposed to be that they were celebrating the influence, that, the weirdness of, of the Catholic faith and in, in when it's, because it's otherworldly. And so if you look back, some of them were a bit crass, maybe. But some of them actually really, some of the designers obviously really got the idea that Catholicism is something otherworldly and it's um, something that really has a creative impetus that I think we've lost and we just need to get it back again you know yeah. Declan? No. I think we'll leave it at that and, Well since we were um, we were referencing a lot of movies earlier on I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw in my own two cents on that I, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the movie Patton but oh, yeah. listening to Father Brendan speak yeah. I had nothing other in my head than George C. Scott uh, George C. Scott's opening speech and uh, it's very powerful and everyone leaves that speech wanting to go out and take those Nazis by the throat and, and, and deal with them. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we all feel very much the same way, uh, motivated, uh, fired up. And, and uh, uh, the, the military historian, Victor David, uh, David Hanson, um, David Hanson he, he, he reckons that war could have been ended if they gave Patton his head maybe six months earlier. Yeah. But he slapped that soldier. And yes, PC. And, and as he said, PC. a therapeutic society. They actually let how many die because just to punish him, right? But, but uh, there we are. Right. There's a, there's, I think there's a, there's a line to some effect in that in that opening speech where he says, 
when you're sitting on your porch 50 years from now and you take your grandson on your knee, he's going to ask you, what did you do, granddaddy, in, in, in the Great World War? And are you just going to look at him and say, well, I shoveled shit in Louisiana? You're going to, many of you will have grandsons and you'll be having them on, their, on your knee and they're going to ask you, what did you do when, you know, uh, the shit hit the fan in the Catholic Church in Ireland? Putting it crassly, but that's how Patton did it. And you better have a good answer for him. We'll leave it there. <laughs>